I'm going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And these are just a few you know, over trends that um, we think should be you know, considered here. I'm going to start by picking on Samsung a little bit in the sense that I'm using Samsung as an example of a trend because here is a manufacturer that's opened up a flagship. It's called Samsung 837. It's in New York City and perhaps uh, we should note that it's in the meat packing district. But Samsung 837 is a very um, experimental, interactive uh, building designed around Samsung technology and innovation. The building has so much going for it in the sense of the multiple hands-on product areas, interactive art, virtual reality. It has a lounge area. It has a, a uh, full-fledged studio where you can create content. It has a special area where they focus on community and a company called Black Egg, which is a, a world-class expert in storytelling, you know, can wow you with the interactive ability of some immersive content. This is a company called Black Egg that supports Samsung. And all of this is centered around, which was at the time, the world's largest multimedia video wall. It's three stories tall, 96 55-inch screens build this massive Samsung branding experience as you go through the Samsung flagship. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because it cost $43 million to build. I can see a lot of retail accountants just turning white at the moment. $43 million, and the kicker is the only thing you can buy in it is a cup of American coffee. You can't buy any product in this store. And therefore, the people explain it, you know, and they, they try to do it in a careful way. They say, I don't want you to buy anything here. I want people to learn about our products in a hassle-free environment. A $43 million hassle-free environment. I'd like them to learn about my products in a $43 million hassle-free environment. And they explain, we try to reinvent the flagship of tomorrow. This is all the best ideas, including the ones we can pinch from the Apple Store. These are all the best ideas that we can put forward. And they call it unretail. Their thinking is that the flagship of modern retail is unretail. Not non-retail, unretail. And this is uh, the manager of the area, and he said, people don't need another store to buy. They got plenty of ways to buy Samsung. Plenty of ways to buy Samsung. This place is a place where we show the brand. Now, again, you know, I'm using it as an illustration here to, to talk about how vendors get tempted to become retailers. And this happens, it seemingly happens in cycle, but the latest cycle is, of course, kicked off by Apple. Apple has an amazing product that knocked incumbent vendors out of their space in the mobile communications. It knocked incumbent vendors, I mean, Microsoft was praying for a tablet business and it just never happened until Apple did it with iPad. They were able, as a manufacturer, to create superior products, superior experiences, and then they opened a retail store in conjunction with that superior product and in conjunction with that superior experience. Many 
manufacturers still have wonderful, great products, but it still isn't what Apple did at its time. And this retail opportunity that presented itself to Apple, where Apple then went on to drive a retail experience that also has better numbers than leaders in our industry like Best Buy, the fact was it created a massive Apple envy and there was a rash of vendors trying to uh, create these unretail places or retail imitations and it's something which disturbs the retail universe but probably not a permanent quake in it you know other than the fact of the Apple experience and Apple in their stores part of the news that you should be aware of is that the the Apple retail chief this is Angela Andretz you know who has been the stalwart of taking the original idea from Ron Johnson and his retail experience which helped Apple break in to take it to the next level to build communities to have more of an experiential uh, aspect and redesigned all the stores she's leaving Apple and that is of course something that happens in large companies people do move on we don't know yet why or where but that's not the thing I want you to take away today. What I'd like you to take away today is who is replacing Angela? And the answer is that Deidre O'Brien, who's a long-standing Apple employee, but she happens to be the head of human resources. Suddenly, human resources is going to be in charge of the Apple stores. Now, without contemplation, that seems, huh, why'd they do that? But part of what Apple has learned about their secret in retailing, part of what makes those retail stores work, is the people element, the staff level, the dedication, passion, and the training of those people. And if you look at it in those contexts, you can understand that Apple feels it has a secret sauce, and the secret sauce is not in the store. It's not in the design. And yes, of course, some of it's in the product, but it's actually in, in the cadre, in the body of people that they manage to put in front for their customer experience. Human resources is going to become the most important asset in a world where retail battles e-tail. I wanted to mention Amazon just briefly. You know, it's the uh, figures have come out from the Consumer Technology Association saying, you know, hey, we've got a 398 billion retail business. It just happened to coincide with a chart taken from Amazon showing which product categories generate how much of their percentage of sales. And if you do the math, you know, Amazon successfully has, without much, you know, uh, there's a lot of crossover between different categories, but, you know, here you have one massive e-tailer that takes more than 10% chunk out of a big market like America easily in one bite without extending those definitions to include a lot of the things that are in our stores today. They, they've been calling it a retail apocalypse. And one of the interesting things when you look at the retail apocalypse numbers is you see that we would be far better off running pet stores than we would consumer electronics stores we would be far safer, far less risk. And part of how we got here is because we embraced technology, we embraced change, we embraced the excitement and a petit peu of the glamour that we have in our type of business. 
but the price you pay for it is that you have to be the best of the best and to stay on top. One good reason that people have come all across the world even to join here at Distri EMEA. So apparently not most of us will, will survive the retail apocalypse, but Best Buy has. And five or six years ago, we were pretty sure Best Buy was walking in the steps of a Radio Shack, a Toys R Us. We were pretty sure they were headed for a lot of danger. As press, we were not so kind to Best Buy at that point, and you know, hopefully uh, it helped them because they learned how to survive. They put together a plan. The plan sounds so general, so vague, so, you know, you've heard it before. But their plan was they were going to reinvigorate a customer experience. What the heck does that mean? They're going to uh, attract leadership. They're going to work with vendor partners, which usually means mugging them for better opportunities. They're going to make sure their investors have a, uh, have a good return because the retail apocalypse, unseen by us, really has a financial component where a lot of companies are really going down because of the money they've borrowed, the financial structuring, the deals with private equity, which I assure you is one of the horrible things uh, uh, in the financial world and is only in a small percentage of blessing. Um, the continuing leadership and sustainability, which has become so important in the world, and uh, they recently won the most sustainable company in America award, Best Buy, who would believe it? But the point I wanted to underline here was that it, it's hard because they have these platitudes, because they have these soft sounding things that we journalists hate, but it's the execution of that customer experience. It's what do you do about making employees at the best they can be and the leaders that you need. This is where, as a journalist, we have to drill down and get into because on the surface of it, it's quite something that everybody says. Yeah, we believe in customer experience. In Europe, I wanted to mention what Saturn and MediaMark are doing because they're having the first cashier-less consumer electronics store, at least here in Europe and Austria. And one of the things they've done as a part of an innovation is they've tried to concentrate on technology for the stores. But the piece I wanted to share this morning is the joint venture that they've created between MediaMark and Fnac Darty. It's not that MediaMark doesn't own enough of Finac Darty to say, come joint venture with us. This is not the exciting part of the news. The exciting part of the news comes with what they want to do with that joint venture. And that joint venture deserves a lot more press than it's seen here in Europe. That joint venture is going to concentrate on four areas. You know, the area is working with vendors, which means mugging vendors for better deals. It's also going to concentrate on sourcing product for their own brands, private label, part of the salvation of surviving the retail apocalypse. And the area that I find most interesting is they're going to concentrate on big data. Their concern is that an e-tailer giant like Amazon has all the information about what's happening in the market. Who's going to buy? What are they buying? What are the price points? They feel they're getting outplayed on data. And this company that they've created is going around Europe talking to other retailers and would certainly talk to many of you if you are a leader in your country. They're trying to build a union of retail 
that can work as an alliance that can stand and balance what in the ETEL category Amazon has at their fingertips. They're coming together, even though they're competitors, but they're coming together to work together. I need to speed up because I'm going to uh, have to make room for the other speakers here, but I, I just want to mention that the whole direction one is trying to go as large retail organizations is the omni-channel, and many of you have a very holy appearance on omni-channel. Uh, retailers are embracing technology, but this is not my story, so I'm going to click through it, but you're more than welcome to have the slides of some of the technology some of the companies specifically that a company like Media Saturn has invested in to help it during this time. But I wanted to bring you back to that thing about customer experience. I wanted to drill down into customer experience and I'm just going to give you examples that you can read for yourself up here of some of the elements and some of the things that people are trying within that customer experience category. It is, in my opinion, still all about customer experience, but there's one catch. There's just one thing. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean... That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you got to figure out. And I'm going to leave you with the one thing, because you still have to figure it out, customer experience for yourself. Thank you very much.